Good evening, Sport Zonian. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Agliamoro. I am your host for this is Sports Zone. Coming to you like, like we do just about every week here via the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network. we got a good show for you tonight. We'll be joined by Dave Hastings in a matter of moments. Hopefully we will be joined by Eric Tressley tonight. He is dealing with things associated with his upcoming wedding, which is a little over a month away. So shout out to Eric on that one. We are back here, folks. Yes. As I released in a YouTube video last week, unfortunately, uh, well, we all have limits in terms of how long we can go without sleep, and my limit is 27 hours. So, unfortunately, we did not have a show last week, um, but we are back tonight, and we got two weeks worth of sports to talk about, which is a good thing because obviously we're in kind of a, a long period in uh, the big three uh, uh, American professional sports. So we'll be covering uh, as much as we can of the last couple of weeks. And of course, baseball-wise, very big uh, event happened earlier today. Uh, one of the big two remaining free agents in baseball did, in fact, sign. Manny Machado, third baseman, shortstop, will be playing with the San Diego Padres for the next – 10 years at $300 million over those 10 years. Trade does include an opt-out after the fifth season. They are apparently still ironing out um, so, some of the uh, little, little stipulations and clauses in the contract. It doesn't look like it's going to be made official until about Thursday or Friday. But, yeah, Machado goes to the San Diego Padres, which I, to me, that, that's a huge surprise right there. And, you know, hopefully if Eric comes on, we'll be able to get his opinion. But uh, it's pretty obvious to me, based on this signing and based on everything that's transpired, uh, between talk of a work stoppage at the end of the current baseball club bargaining agreement, words of Rob Manfred, how the players have all kind of felt like they've gotten the shaft from the owners. It is pretty obvious to me, as much as no one is saying it, Everybody thought the Yankees were going to be more involved in the negotiations with the big-name free agents this offseason than they really have been. And I think if you would have looked at this free agent landscape three years ago, I think everybody probably thought the Yankees were going to be much more involved than they have been. Uh, they haven't really signed too many free agents. I think DJ uh, Matthew was the only real free agent they signed. They traded for James Paxton. They re-signed Jay Happ and CC Sabathia, who formally announced that this will be his final season, which I think we all kind of saw coming, especially after he had uh, an angioplasty a couple months ago. I think we all kind of knew the end was near on that one. Um, so, yeah, I think everybody kind of thought the Yankees were going to be more involved. And I think two or three years ago, I think even the Yankees thought they would be more involved this offseason. Than they had been. But when you look at how players like Miguel Andubar and Michael Torres have really popped for them, especially last year, and now they look like they're going to be long term pieces for the Yankees. And the fact that they had a Giancarlo Stanton uh, via trade last year, you know, the, the, um, the explosion of Andubar and Torres kind of takes them out of the, the race for Machado because they don't have a need for him at third base or shortstop because you can always move Torres over to shortstop if Didi Gregorius leaves in a couple of years. And, of course, he's hurt, but um, they weren't going to sign Machado while they still had Gregorius in a position where he is going to be back at some point in the season. They signed Trey Tulowitzki for that one. Um, <clears throat> so you don't need him there. And then you have Stanton in the outfield along with Judge. These are two corner outfielders. Harper has played center field, but especially as he gets older, you know he's going to move to a corner outfield position. It's not that the Yankees didn't want to spend money, but when you have all these overlapping pieces there, it just makes sense that they wouldn't be as much in the market for these guys as they would have been 
had Torres not popped, had had uh, Andrew Barr not popped, had they not signed Stanton, you don't have a need for him. So when you take the Yankees off the board, as much as I'm not, you know, obviously I'm a Mets fan, not a Yankee fan, but the Yankees tend to be the, one of the teams that really drive the market because the teams that drive the market and tend to pay the players are the ones that have the biggest payrolls traditionally. Take them out of the equation. Then you have the Red Sox who have all this young talent on their roster from Xander Bogarts to Mookie Betts to uh, Ben Intendi. Uh, I believe that they, they, they – I'm not remembering his name right now, but they have a third baseman too, uh, Raphael Peverance at the very least, one of their third base options. So they're not a team that was going to be in play for Machado. And, you know, at the beginning of the offseason, they were actually thinking about trying to trade some of their um, now veteran players, including Bogarts in there. So you take them off. If you don't have the Red Sox or the Yankees in bidding wars for anything, then you're leaving to the rest of baseball. And the fact is the rest of baseball isn't exactly as anxious to give out big dollar contracts to guys. Now, the, the fact that the Padres are the one that gave the contract to Machado, uh, it's funny to me. I don't want to hear out of Machado's mouth that I'm hoping to win a World Series. I want to go to a team that is going to be competitive. I don't want to hear these words out of Machado's mouth at all. Because Padres ain't winning World Series over the next five years. They, they ain't winning it over the next ten years. They won 66 games last year. 66 games last year. You play 162 games over the course of the season, and they won 66 last year. Now, if you look at their roster, I don't, I don't think they're going to be bad this, that bad this year, even before they brought Machado on board. Eric Hosmer, who is the big offseason expenditure for them last season, they gave a ridiculous eight-year contract to. He was not worth that, but he's a good player. You have Will Myers there. I'm getting to that, Cousin David. Thank you. Thank you, Cousin David. Getting to that. Don't jump ahead on me. You have Will Myers, who's another very good bat. I've always been a big Will Myers fan. May not be the best in terms of batting average, but he's a guy who can hit 25, 30 home runs a year. So you have a very solid 3, 4, 5 in your lineup there. And, yes, as my cousin pointed out in the chat room, they do have the best farm system in baseball right now, led by Fernando Tatis Jr., um, who, if I'm not mistaken, was actually ranked number one of uh, all Major League Baseball prospects by MLBPipeline.com. And he's probably going to be up at some point this season, too. If Machado's playing in third base, you have him at shortstop. They did sign Ian Kinsler earlier in the offseason. So you actually have a very solid infield if you're the Padre. Um, Fernando Tatis was a great player with the Cardinals, yes, but he did have some very good Mets moments, David. Let's not forget that. And he wasn't even that great for that long because he was out of baseball for about two, three years before the Mets brought him back on seven. Anyway, um, you have Hosmer, Kinsler, Tatis Jr., hopefully it's short, and then Machado. You have some good catching talent behind the plate in uh, the, the, the kid they got from the Indians, Francisco Mejia. You have Austin Hedges, another uh, highly regarded uh, catching prospect there. And then you have a lot of players in the outfield. It, it was said earlier today they're going to play Will Myers at left field. Still have Manuel Margot, a former Red Sox farm man. Um, he's probably the center fielder. And then you have a couple other guys in that in that mix uh, the left field. And the names are escaping me right now. But they are going to have actually a pretty solid lineup. Um, you look at their pitching, though. And on the surface, it, it looks like it's completely devoid of any talent. But one of the nice things about pitching in Petco is uh, you don't really have to be a big name pitcher. You don't really have to have uh, the upper echelon of pitching talent. And you can still put together a pretty good pitching staff because Petco, as I've said before, is, is one of the best pitchers ballparks in baseball. And to me, that, that's probably the one downside of Machado going to Petco because Petco is one of those ballparks where home runs kind of go to die. Um, so I, if I'm Machado, the, the thing I'd be worried about, because I still think he's one of the best players in baseball, in my opinion, definitely one of the top five. And, you know, whether or not um, 
he's able to hit home runs. I still think he's going to get on base a lot. I still think he's going to get a lot of doubles. I don't think – I think the days of him hitting 30, 40 home runs are gone. Uh, I definitely I definitely do. But if he can still hit 20, 25 home runs in that lineup, I think he'll be just fine. And, yes, David, you actually bring up a good point because the thing about the Padres, they've shown over the last couple off seasons they have no problem throwing money around. And I heard someone say that they, uh, they may actually – still be in on Bryce Harper, which would be amazing to me if they go out and they, they're able to nab not just Machado, but um, but also get Harper. I don't think it's going to happen. But, uh, I mean, apparently that's, that's still an option. But, um, yeah, the, the practical thing right now is Dallas Keuchel is still a free agent. Could they wind up doing something like what the Phillies did last year with Jake Arrieta and the, like a three or four year contract with some opt out clauses in the contract? I can't remember exactly how Arietta's contract was worded. But yeah, I think it's still feasible that they do something like that. Three year, I don't think three year gets it done with Keichel. I think he would I think he wanted a four year at the beginning of the uh, off season. I think he'd still wind up holding out for a four four year. And I think if you put him in San Diego I think if you put him in San Diego for four years, I think he would actually do very well over those four years. I think it would be pretty interesting to see. Anyway, with that, we welcome Dave Hastings to the show. Dave, how you doing? I'm good, Mike. My apologies. Lost track of time. No, I, listen. After last week, I'm not going to get on anybody for anything when it comes to being short on time or anything like that. So, uh, <laughs> I was just I, I, I the only reason I said you had text, I was just like, hey, I don't mind talking a little baseball to start off the show, but I ain't doing this by myself, right? Yeah, I no, I, I remember doing the days of the show by myself. That's that's a whole whole different thing. But at least you got cousin Dave in here. So yes, yeah, yes. you got something about somebody to bounce things off with you. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Shout out to your cousin for the, the consistency. Yeah, David Dave is the man. I have I haven't actually seen him in a while, but I love Dave. I've always loved David since we were kids. Uh, I, I mean Mike, I mean there's a common theme here. I mean me, Dave, your cousin Dave, you know, I mean common theme, just great people. It, it comes with the word and, and David. And how can you how can you forget? I mean, he hasn't been a part of the show in a while, but Dave Tice. Dave Tice. There you go. I'm just saying that yep. there's a trend there. Yeah. It's, it's no coincidence. Mm-hmm. I've always thought it was funny that on this show you got you, Tice, uh, cousin David, and then you got me. You had Macquarie for a while. You had your boy Mike Bale on the show for a little bit there. We, we don't really um, accessorize when it comes to the names too much. I think Eric's as far north as we get on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had jo- – my boy Joey once came down to the studio, but that was when we yeah. in the, were in the uh, studio. I think that was before my time, though. You guys started the show, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, me and him. Uh, yeah. he, was, he was my first co-host. And you want to laugh, though. Joe is actually David's father today. My, yeah, I mean, my, it, my, my, my uncle, my uncle. It all comes full circle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So I've just spent the last 10 minutes or so talking about Manny Machado signing with the Padres earlier today. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but if you do, definitely feel free. If not, what, what would you like to talk about tonight, Dave? Well, I mean, first, I will say this. Uh, if you're a parent raising a kid and want them to get into a sport, and I asked you, would you rather them spend from 20 – what's – how old is Machado? 25? 20 I, – he's tw- I think he's 25 or 26, something like that. All right. So, if I asked you, would you rather – 26. All right. So, if I asked you, if you rather have your kid from 26 to 36 play baseball and make $300 million, or from 26 to maybe 32 – Play football and make forty or fifty million. Which which option are you gonna go as a parent when you're sitting there? And that's I mean, come on, I don't I don't have kids. I'm not gonna act like I know how parents think, but still, all right. 
Cousin David has seen the chat. Quarterbacks make more money. <laughs> That's quarterbacks, funny. I mean, think about the high, most recent highest paid quarterback contract. That was Kirk Cousins. He got a guaranteed $84 million over three years. That's not the highest annually, but it's the highest guaranteed, though. That's but that's that's yeah. really what it all comes mm-hmm. down to. It's the guaranteed money over yeah. one period of time. That's what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. So when you look at it that way, he's still not making the same amount of money and he won't have the longevity of that money on a consistent basis. Um I completely agree though, but that's actually your cousin brings it up exactly where I was going. Yeah, they so needed if thinking at, if you're thinking as a parent which way you want your kids to go. You're going to look at baseball, basketball, and hockey. All three leagues, contracts are guaranteed. Now, there are clauses for percentages of it to come off and all that, but players get the majority of the money that is written into their contract. The NFL is the only one where you basically get the majority of your contract up front within the first two to three years and that's it. Everything else after that, you are not guaranteed a single dollar. Mm-hmm. So you blow your leg out and they cut you. All right, yeah, your medical bills are covered. You got you got hurt while working, so you're going – your medical bills are covered for that. But after that, what guarantees do you have? Nothing. So I, I just – you know, like, like your cousin points out in the chat room, this is all going back to the new uh, collective bargaining agreement. That's going to be, you know, dealt with in the next two years. And, you know, the things that they got to get ready for, because the players need to get, I'm not saying they need to be paid more money. I understand the salary cap. I I actually like the salary cap, but you still have to get a a more substantial part of that money to the players as a guaranteed moment. Mm. So I just, you know, I think that's really kind of where my mind goes with it. I mean, congrats to the guy. Ten years, three hundred million dollars to get to play in one of the most beautiful cities in the entire country in a in a in a bit in a in a league where the season runs from what is it, early April to well to October. Well, for the Padres, it'll be the first week in October because the Padres ain't making the playoffs this year. Uh, either way, I'm just saying it's it's one of those things where I good congratulations for him and you know but he if he ever wants to trade places with me I'd be down for it. Yeah, to kind of I mean to kind of go back to your original question there I mean it does kind of seem like a no brainer at this point I mean for reasons you said the guaranteed money um, and the longevity and the health aspect and everything like that. And David, cousin David brought up quarterbacks make more money. Yeah. But there are so few quarterbacks when you look in relation to the amount of players in the NFL, I mean, quarterbacks, I'd be surprised if they make up 15% of all the players in the NFL right now. Cause what you only have, you go three quarterbacks per team. You only have 93 of them. And then you have 53 rosters times 30. That's over a hundred. That's over. Um, I mean, I, I'm sucking at doing the math in my head right now, but that's like fifteen hundred players in the league. He's so. If you're not a quarterback, yeah, you ain't, you ain't making anything. But to go to your thing, I it it just reminded me of something very interesting because I remember a couple of years ago, it was right before the Super Bowl, and I'm talking to this kid who I work with, or I used to work with, I should say. And I said to her something to the effect of, are you watching the Super Bowl tonight? And she gave me this thing. Uh, we don't really watch the Super Bowl because we, we don't need to watch high-priced athletes play. And I kind of – I tried to explain to her. I was like, you know, I think you have that impression because that's the way it is in sports, but the NFL is kind of different. Yeah, you see the big contracts they get, but not everything is guaranteed. It's much more cutthroat in the NFL. And there's a certain thing where they, they can drop you just as easily as they sign you. And if you don't play a lot of those cases, there's no, this is not the guaranteed money. And I had explained to her the way the contracts work in the NFL. And as you brought up, if you look at the NFL contracts in relation to baseball, basketball, hockey, it's much more archaic in a sense. It's, it's, it's so much more of a throwback to the days of like the 50s and 60s where if you didn't play, you didn't get paid. And the guarantees can go very quickly. And as, as Cousin David is saying, it's insane because the amount of money the NFL brings in is crazy. Plus players 
All right, you're going too fast. You're going too fast here. I missed the whole thing. Uh, plus, in the NFL, gets less money in their pensions, and up until recently, over 60 didn't get health care. Dave, you brought up almost 40% higher profits than any of the four major sports in the U.S. In the U.S. So, yeah, it's definitely crazy. And like you said, in the coming uh, collective bargaining negotiation, that should definitely change. Because, yeah, I mean, if you're a kid and you look at things from a strictly economic standpoint, why are you going to – I mean, definitely not if you're Kyler Murray, but I think for the rest of the youth out there, why are you going to risk so much to play in the NFL and you're not even going to get a fully guaranteed contract where you can go to baseball or basketball, and even if you suck, you get, you're getting a lot more guaranteed than you would in the NFL. Like, basketball is changing that now. Basketball – the contracts aren't as fully guaranteed as they used to be like four or five years ago. There's a lot more non-guaranteed contracts in basketball than they used to be. But still, there's a lot more money flowing around for the players than in the NFL. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, it, there's, there's, I mean, this is a really in-depth topic. And, I mean, I know there's a lot of a couple other things to get to because I really I'm fighting something sore throat, all that fun crap. So, mm. um, um, uh, I, I really got to get off at like 9:30 or so. I really okay. kind of want to bounce around, but there's a lot to this, and um, your your cousin makes good points. I mean, and the like the NFL, the players actually get, I believe it's 49 percent of of the revenue like that is is like split amongst them or so. I don't know how to explain it but it, it's <laughs> it's still just one of those things where that's where my mind takes it every time I hear these contracts in baseball and basketball and you know like it, it's just crazy so but mm -hmm. with that said uh, I, I that's really the only thoughts I have when it comes down to Machado this is where my mind goes when I hear this yeah, uh, when when it was first announced, David, uh, cousin David, actually texted me, and he said something, something to the effect of, uh, "Oh, he got way too much money, way too many years." I mean, it's an opt out after five years, and we can debate all day about whether or not it's too much money. But the the, the only point I'll make on this, and I'm gonna move on, is you know, a couple years, players don't hit for the agency at the age of twenty five or twenty six anymore. It just doesn't happen as much. The last guy to really do it was Jason Hayward back in 2015. He got a $184 million contract over eight years with an opt-out after four years. Dude's not even half as good as Manny Machado. Manny Machado is easily one of the top five players if you're looking at it just from a talent perspective. You can say what you want about his attitude and everything. He comments me about not, not hustling out every play, and I know that pissed off a lot of people, and rightfully so. But in terms of a talent perspective, uh, he's got every reason to be the most paid, highly paid, played player in the game, at least until Bryce Harper signs his contract on the next week. So I, I don't really have a problem with it. I know he said, David says he's just happy the Yankees aren't paying for it. It is what it is on that one. I just I think it's funny he goes to the Padres, man, because, I, you know, you say – I'll tell you that, and I'm, I'm going to apologize for taking up time here, man, but one thing I want to say, you know, people hate LeBron James for starting the super teams, and they hate Kevin Durant for going to the Golden State Warriors and all that stuff. These guys took less money to do that because they wanted to win. When you see a guy like Machado take this contract to go to a team like the Padres, I, I would rather super teams the guys who are only trying to get paid and not trying to win. I don't know about, I don't know about you on that thing. Well, I mean, uh, see, I don't know. Because to me, baseball is not a game where one guy can literally flip the entire league. And basketball is. So I, I, I kind of – I see your point. I don't think you're really off on your point. I don't think you're wrong for saying it. I just – in basketball, I don't know. It bothers me more. But maybe that's also because I just – I'm closer to the sport itself. I don't know. Mm. But, yeah, I – uh, I definitely – I can definitely see your point. I'll say that. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You're right in that one player doesn't change everything in baseball like basketball or something like that. But even even with that said, LeBron went with Wade and Bosch. Durant goes to a team that has Klay Thompson, Stephen Curry, and Draymond Green. 
Manny Machado goes to a team that has Eric Hosmer, Will Myers, and not really a great pitching staff. So it is what it is on that one. Um, before I bring up a couple topics from the last couple weeks, do you have anything that's been sticking out in your mind that you would like to bring up today? I, I, I'm shocked to see Antonio Brown becoming Terrell Owens. Um, <laughs> well said. Well said. I, yeah, I feel I feel like what's next is a holdout and sit ups in his driveway. So <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I think you know I've been I'm amped for tomorrow night's Duke North Carolina game. That should be awesome. And uh, yeah, really off the top of my head, man, those are the first two things that come to my mind. Let's we'll stick with the Antonio Brown thing real quick because I guess it came out early today that he met with Art Rooney, the owner of the Steelers, and it does look like he's getting traded. I mean, we've kind of seen this coming for about a month now. Where do you think he winds up uh, ending up, and what type of what type of package do you think the Steelers are going to get back for him? I mean, look, they traded San Antonio Holmes after winning the Super Bowl MVP for a fourth-round draft pick to the Jets. So, I mean. He was, I never, he was never as talented as Antonio Brown, though. Oh, I completely agree. I'm just saying, you you know that the Steelers, when they say they're going to trade somebody, teams know they don't have to go in too high to have a chance to be able to get the player they're trying to trade for. Mm. But me personally, I could see a team like Indianapolis, maybe if he can click with T.Y. Hilton. I could see um, uh, what's it called, the Eagles, because Golden Tate is no longer going to be with the team. So I could see the Eagles trying to make a play for him. Jets, maybe. I don't know if they want to put him around such a uh, – put their young quarterback around a guy like him right now. San Francisco seems to be the consistent name coming out. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you right now, dude, I know, it, I know it's kind of sad to say, but I don't know if I'd – like if Dallas was to go after him, I wouldn't want them sacrificing too much. I mean, Amari was a first-round draft pick already. You really, I don't like the idea of them trading more, you know, picks to get a guy that's going to cost them as much money as he would cost them. Well, I agree. I agree with that sentiment uh, completely. I'm fine with Amari Cooper. What I do think that's kind of going to set the bar for what the Steelers are going to get in return for uh, Brown. I mean, you brought up the fourth round pick for Holmes. I don't, if you're the Steelers, I don't see how you trade Antonio Brown for anything less than at least one first round pick. I don't see how you do that. The dude is easily one of the top three receivers in the NFL. Take all the other bullshit out of the equation. Because, yes, he is kind of turning into Terrell Owens. I think I might have said that at one point um, over the late oh, – if not on air, I definitely said that at some point. But uh, I totally agree with that sentiment. But, um, you know, in terms of talent, it's him, it's Odell Beckham, and it's maybe one or two other wide receivers in terms of top talent. So you have to get a first-round pick back for him. I think it would be funny if he goes to the Jets and then the Jets wind up signing Le'Veon Bell and then they basically turn into the Steelers North. I don't think they do anywhere as good with the two of them as the Steelers have over the last few years. But that that would definitely be interesting. San Francisco is the team I could definitely see doing it. With Garoppolo coming back this year, I think they would have the most onus on them to get a player that could put them over the top line. Well, yeah, and I think a guy like him really gives them a competitive uh, catch-up. I won't say balance, but a catch-up against St. Louis – or, I'm sorry, the Rams and the Seahawks because those are the two teams they're really battling with. Arizona's mm-hmm. got some time before they're competitive. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I just think that's that, – that's I think that's a smart play by San Francisco. Um, but I also I, – I mean – I think the trade, though, in all honesty, I think whoever trades for him, I think we will be shocked by the team that trades for him. Mm, I can I can definitely see that. Uh, the one thing I wanted to bring up last week, but obviously I didn't get a chance to, Kareem Hunt going to the Cleveland Browns. I don't know if he plays this season, given everything that's happening. I think it's kind of surprising that any team would really sign him, not really knowing what's going to happen with him last like, uh, next year. What were your thoughts when that happened? Well, I mean, you got to keep in mind, the owners are, are are basically part of the committee that makes the decisions on suspensions. Mm. 
So they have to have an idea of what it is. And after he was signed, you know, Schefter came out and said that, you know, the expected punishment is supposed to be eight to ten games. And, you know, for a guy like that, you get him on a one-year deal, eight to ten games, you know when he played, he's going to give you everything he's got. And Cleveland's really trying to ride the momentum that they got going. I, I it, like, yeah, I mean, I'm actually with your cousin. Like, it's a good football move by the Browns, but it's definitely kind of crappy. And here's the thing, because I agree with that sentiment, too. Cleveland has had a lot of goodwill behind it because of the way they ended the season. I think everybody wants to see the underdog win. And Cleveland is always a perennial underdog team, given everything that has happened with that franchise since it restarted in 2000. I feel like a move like this kind of takes a lot of that goodwill away heading into what could have been. They should have nothing but positive thoughts with the way they ended the season. The way they ended the season, they look like a team that can make a playoff push next year. And now you can to bring Kareem Hunt in, and it's like, how does the circus not come to town on this one and completely take over all the good vibes that they were building here? Yeah, no, and you're, you're, I'm completely with you on that. I mean, the only thing that benefits them is it's a small, smaller market town, so you're not mm-hmm. like – compared to a New York team or Dallas or New Orleans, like those bigger market teams and the media coverage that would bring. So I, I, I completely agree with you. I'm just, you know, that's the one thing that works in their benefit. Yeah. That's about the only thing really. If they, if they were at the press coverage that, uh, excuse me, if they were in a place like New York or Los Angeles where the media attention is a hundred times more than being in Cleveland, they would never be able to do something like this in life. And you would completely consume everything going on with their franchise. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tell you what, I, I know you got to get uh, you got to get out of here in a couple minutes. Uh, what, real quick, we could turn to basketball real quick. I don't know if you watched anything from All-Star Weekend. I certainly didn't. Any thoughts, anything you're looking forward to in the second half of the NBA season? I mean, look, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That kid, uh, Donich, I think it is, from Dallas. Donich, yeah. It, man, he's something special. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. From the All-Star game, I I it was, I it thought it was a fun game from what I got the opportunity to watch. I didn't get to watch a lot of the game, but from what I did watch, I thought it was fun. And Damian Lillard just doesn't get the respect he deserves in this mm. league. I don't care what anybody has to say. He just does not get the respect he deserves. Mm-hmm. So I just want to, you know, credit to him. Giannis coming out and really kind of showing that, you know, hey, he's ready to roll with the big boys. Um, you know, and look, LeBron, LeBron – is a monster, and that team that he put together was monstrous, and they made the comeback and had the win, and I just – I don't know if he's going to be able to get that Laker team to uh, to the playoffs this year. It's going to be hard. Well, as of right now, they open the second half three games out of that eighth seed, and the Clippers hold the eighth seed. So they got a shot because I don't think that Clipper team is really that strong that they're a lot to make the playoffs. But the Kings, I think the Kings got – I want to see the Kings make the playoffs more than I want to see the Lakers make the playoffs at this point. I'd love to see them get in as an eighth seed. But that move they made for Harrison Barnes, I, I, I think they got a better shot than the Lakers at this point. Yeah, I won't argue with that. But how great would it be to see LeBron match up with that young Lakers squad against Golden State in the first round? It'd be fun. It would definitely be fun. And I, I, I think it's just because you take LeBron out of it. I, King's got a young team, too, man. I mean, to see De'Aaron Fox and Buddy Hyde and, um, and what, Coley Stein and all those guys going up against them, I think that – I mean, I still think it would probably only be a four- or five-game series, but I think that would be pretty interesting, too. It would be – I'm just saying, it would be fun and it would be one hell of a – like, come on, what the LeBron lovers – could you imagine? Just imagine what they would do if somehow he led that team through Golden State in the first round. Oh my God! 
It would be insane. It would. It would be. And I, I tell you this. I'll give. I'll give him this. If, if by some miracle the Lakers were to make the playoffs and beat the Warriors as a as an eight seed, beating a one seed, it, it would make that uh, Jordan is the greatest argument. It would make it harder. I'm not saying I would concede it to him, but it would make it harder. Oh, they would definitely have another chip to be able to push into the table of that. Yeah. Argument. Sure. Yeah, and that and that'd be a hell of a chip, man. That really would be. What would your prediction be on that? What would your prediction be on it? Just right now, speculation wise. You think they you think they don't? What, that the Lakers would be able to beat them? Yeah. No. Hell no. I mean, I don't either. I just wanna I just wanted to hear your prediction. Five or six oh, games. Hell, oh hell no. Maybe they win a game. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I I totally agree with you on that. And last question, and then I'll let you out of here. Anthony Davis, you think he plays the rest of the season, or you think they're going to wind up sitting him? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they've let him play a few games just due to the, you know, resting rule. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, yeah, no, I don't think he plays too much. Yep. No, I tend to agree with you on that one. Absolutely. All right, man. I will let you. I will let you go. Again, cousin David is saying he plays too. Yeah, I mean the NFL already. I mean, excuse me, the NBA already threatened them with a fine if they did so. So they got that going for them. But all right, Dave. I will let you go, man. Thank you for being here this week. Um, you know, you've said it a few times on the show over the last couple of months. I wish Eric was here so I could say this to both you guys here too. So this is my favorite time of the week, being able to talk sports with you and Eric here. You guys are among my best friends. I love you both. Uh, thank you guys for being here every week. And I thank you for not being too pissed off at me for my little hoops from last week. <laughs> no worries, Mike. And it, it is always a pleasure to be here, man. And thankful that we can still do something like this. And uh, hopefully next week feeling better and uh, we can bang out a whole show. But you have yourself a good evening. Cousin good. David, thank you for always being here as well, my man. You have a good night as well. And uh, yeah, I'll check you later, Mike. You have a good night. Take care, Dave. Feel better. Thanks, bud. Later. Later. All right, so that was Dave Hastings here on the Sports Zone. I'm going to get out of here myself in a couple minutes. Uh, it does not look like Eric was able to free himself up tonight, so we'll get out of here. Talk a little Manny Machado up at the top. The other thing uh, I kind of wanted to bring up, but we'll go back to baseball here. So Luis Severino signs – uh, he was up for arbitration, I guess, 12 hours before um, Yankees and, and Severino were set to go to the arbitration hearing. They agreed to a four-year extension uh, with the option year for the fifth year. $50 million the contract could be worth at the end of the five years. And uh, I think it's credit to Severino that he was willing to take that money because, you know, you look at what players have been getting in arbitration. Yeah, it's a good deal for the Yankees, no question. I don't know if it's a great deal for Severino because he's getting $10 million a year. He did just won 19 games the last season. The only thing Severino hasn't proved himself capable of doing at this point in his career is being able to pitch effectively in the postseason. That's the only thing he has not been able to do. So to get $10 million a year, and let, let's let's dispel one notion real quick. This isn't really an extension. This is merely the Yankees buying out all his arbitration fees because he was going to be under team control for about four years, if I'm not mistaken. So they only really – the player option year takes out his first year of eligible free agents. So this ain't really an extension. This is just about buying out the arbitration fees. In my opinion – by doing this, and I'm not saying this is a bad deal by any stretch, Severino left money on the table here because you got to figure he's going to improve each year. He's still a pretty young guy. I think he's only about 23, 24 years old. So it's conceivable. I mean, if Jacob DeGrom just got 17, and we'll talk about DeGrom in a minute here, if he gets $17 million, which was not – it wasn't it, – it, that case didn't go to the arbitration trial or anything, but the Mets gave him that. He would have gotten about $13 million in arbitration, so they gave him $17 million. But if he's able to pull that out, 
in his second to last arbitration year. You gotta figure Severino probably left about 10, 20 million dollars on the table all total over the next four years. Maybe 20 million is a little high. Maybe 10 to 15 million dollars probably leaves on the table over the next four years. So it's it's a credit to Severino that he didn't want the headache of everything. He just wanted the security. It does make you once again, or at least I should say, makes me look at the Mets and go, why the hell didn't you idiots do this? with the Grom and Syndergaard back in 2015 when he had the opportunity to. Now, the downside to that is if they would have done this in 2015, they also would have done it to Harvey, and we would have had them. We would have had him for a couple more years, so maybe it's good that he didn't. Shut up, David. Shut up. He will make more on the back end. No, he won't make more on the back end. That's the thing. That's the thing. He'll make more after that fifth option year. Yes. But he, he's not going to make back what he lost. I mean, if you look at the way free agency is going nowadays, he's not going to get more than he would have gotten over those years. You can't – gone are the days where players are signing contracts that make up for money that they lost or money that they would have had in earlier days. If we're seeing one thing right now with, this, with the, the way free agency is working. So I, I dispute and I reject the notion – that he would make that money back up. And as for your other comment, once again, David, shut the hell up. If he turns out to be great at age 28 or 29, he won't become a free agent and he will get good money. How? Okay, um, you just contradicted yourself right there because how will he get good money if he won't become a good free agent? Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't exactly make sense then. I think I get the point you're trying to make, but the words, that, that, no, that not add up. Anyway. We're not going to spend too much time on this. <clears throat> so Jacob DeGrom hinted at a press conference, players are getting more money by not being free agents. Uh, no. Not, uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Because it's not exactly like you're seeing a rash of players getting extensions before free agency. You, you just, I mean, name players who are getting extensions before free agency. You didn't see it with Bryce Harper. You didn't see it with Machado. You're not really seeing it with Trout. Trout and the extensions you're thinking of are more extensions that buy, that aren't real. Stanton, mm, yes, but he also got that while he was still in arbitration, in his arbitration years, if I'm not mistaken. I need to look that up. But he wasn't. He didn't hit free agency yet. That was a contract he got at the tail end of his arbitration years. So if if that's what you mean, uh, all, right, all right. I mean, Sale, same. I, I don't even think Sale's gotten his first contract yet. I'm pretty sure he's still under his arbitration contract. I, I, and if not, I think the White Sox also bought out his uh, arbitration years. I think he's a free agent within the next year or two anyway. Six-year contract with the White Sox that he probably signed while he was still – under arbitration. So I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but, you know, it is what it is on that. Stop interrupting me. All right. Um, <laughs> I love you, Dave. Um, so, yeah, Jacob DeGrom has a press conference where he hints that maybe he'll listen to his agent and start limiting his innings as we get later in the season. Uh, I think that's bullshit. And I think it's just posturing on DeGrom's part. I think Jacob DeGrom is the last person in the world who's ever going to tell his team, tell his manager, and if they were in a heated playoff race come September, and it's the sixth inning of a game, and he's pitching well, and the Mets need the game, DeGrom's the last guy in the world who's going to tell him, I want to come out early. I have to think about preserving my health. Okay, that's laughable at this point that he thought anybody would believe that. But I do want that to put some pressure on the Mets to sign him to an extension. I, I do. Like, I get that he's 30 right now. But um, no, it's not. No, it's not. See, that's exactly that, that right there. That's very naive thinking right there. Jacob DeGrom 2019 situation is not equal to the 2015 Matt Harvey situation in the least, because this is happening before the season begins, 
And because it's the Grom, and because we have three or four years of a body of work of Jacob the Grom, and we've seen what type of gamer he is and how he thrives for the big moments, we can sit back and say, yeah, I think we're full of shit there the Grom. Harvey, it's a different situation because, number one, he wasn't even the guy who said it. It was Scott Boris who said it. It was said during the heat of a September playoff race. And Harvey didn't come out and um, directly dispute it. And then everything that happened in the two or three weeks that happened after it, that happened in the two or three weeks after it, really kind of made you think that they had some sort of control and that, that, that they were going to live up to that. Now, if you saw the playoffs that year, Harvey pissed his ass off. That's the last time we've ever seen the dark night Matt Hart for those 2015 playoffs. And I do agree that the Mets should have signed DeGrom to a long-term extension last year. I do agree with that. I agree with that. I think they should have done it with all the young pitchers, Syndergaard. Even Mats and Wheeler, I would have liked to have seen them do something where they bought out the uh, the arbitration years of their contract, maybe added a one or two year extension beyond that. The one thing, and David, I think this is what you might have meant. The one thing that we have seen over the last 10 years is that if a guy has a couple really good years, he's still on his rookie deal. We have seen teams, maybe not as much over the last three or four years, but we have seen teams buy out the, the last three or four years on their arbitration and give them a one or two year extension beyond that. Uh, the, the, one that the one that I always remember for some reason was Brennan Bosch with the Detroit Tigers. Um, and I think a couple other guys, I think Marlins did it at 1.2 if I'm not mistaken. But <clears throat> I would have liked to see the Mets do something like that. I think if they did something like that, I think fans would have been a lot happier with the way the team was going leading into this season. I think you can avoid having some egg on your face when the guys across town do something like this with Severino. The Wilpons will not push to trade the Grom, especially not this season, because this team, and you look at the NL East landscape, and I've said this a few times, the NL East landscape is wide open right now. You have four teams who have everything breaks right, could wind up winning the division. Okay, there is no clear cut favorite among the Nationals, Phillies, Braves, and Mets. Even if the Phillies sign Bryce Harper, that doesn't make them the clear cut favorite. The Mets could win this division. And it's all speculation at this point because we have to see how the games play out. Mets should have won the World Series a couple years ago. Yeah, and I should have been a millionaire in, back in 2004, David. What the hell does that mean? Should have. Based on what? The Royals actually were the better team that year. If you look at the way that the 2015 playoffs went, going into those playoffs, there is no way if anybody would have thought the Mets actually would have made the World Series. I know I didn't. I was just happy to say, no, you didn't. You're a liar, David. Shut up. Shut up. There's, I, I, like, honestly, in 2015, I was just happy to see the Mets in the playoffs. No way I thought the Mets were making that World Series. You look at that Royals team, the only thing the Mets were better at than the Royals was the pitching staff, which kind of failed. But anyway, now, and who would have thought Johnny Cueto would have pitched like freaking Cy Young and Garnett in that World Series? It should have. Give me a fucking break. Um, two times on the they were heads in three out of four games. Yeah, and then the defense failed, and everybody's got to play familiar because you can't put it on the defense, apparently. Yeah, okay. All right, anyway, shut up. You're interrupting. Um, and I only got two and a half minutes left. Why? Oh, I went back. They were ahead three out of four games. Yeah, the defense was terrible. That was one thing. One of the many things the Royals did better than the Mets that year, defense. We had a god-awful defense that blew everything and threw freaking balls in the stands and turned into Graham Lloyd back in 96. Remember Graham Lloyd? I remember Graham Lloyd. You remember his first pitch as a Yankee? I do. Anyway, um, I would like to see the Mets sign the ground long term. It would be nice. He's 30 years old right now. If you were to give him a five-year contract after five years, $150 million, give him $30 million a year, I, I'd be perfectly fine with that. 
I think that's what he wants right now. I think if you let this go into next season, because the everybody's banging on the fact that the ground's not going to have as good of a season this year as he did last year. And I don't know what the hell you're basing that on because you have a better team around him this year than you did last year. And he won a Cy Young Award when his bullpen blew every other game he was in and his offense couldn't score a damn run. So, yes, he did with a sub-2 ERA last year. He may not get a sub-2 ERA this year. But now that you have a bullpen around him that isn't going to blow every freaking lead that is handed to him, and you have an offense that may be able to score one run again, even if he has a 3, 3.2 ERA, dude's still going to win at least five to seven more games than he won last year on his record. And then what are you going to do next year? And, again, I don't think the Wolfons try to trade him this year because this is a team that could win the division, in my opinion, with the way – the fact that you have one of the best pitching staffs, uh, starting pitching staffs in baseball, if everything stays the way it is with health. You actually have a legitimate bullpen right now. And as much as it would be nice if they got a big bat, you do have a fairly legitimate lineup that is considerably deep, in my opinion. And if Peter Alonzo comes out, you could have a legitimate 30 home run. All right, with that, I am going to get out of here before I get cut off here. That Wolfons will not be. What is, I don't even understand what that means. Anyway, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you, Dave Hastings, for being on the show. As much as sometimes you make my head hurt, David, thank you, Cousin David, for being here. So we're going to get out of here for tonight. Once again, thank you all for listening. We will see you all next week.